Okay, thanks, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, this exhibition, two exhibitions, several exhibitions, one by Sophie Dunlop and one by Marianne Wick. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work from Marianne is about still life, and Sophie's work is both still life and also landscape. Um, to explore a bit further about their concept and uh, also their art practice, um, we have uh, Ian Grant, a renowned artist, um, who um, has been quite actively coming to our gallery and, and supporting all our artists, so it's fantastic for him to um, be here to have a chat to both Sophie and Marianne, so I'd like you all to welcome all three of them. Thank you, Simon. Well, um, welcome. Uh, it's great to see people, a sufficient group of people here so that we can uh, continue with the discussions, the discourse that uh, uh, I think will help to give people a great deal more insight into the exhibitions, both of Sophie's uh, 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 and Marianne's. Um, because, as Simon observed, an, an, an obvious similarity between the two exhibitions, although there are other areas of the exhibition where there is significant difference, and we'll, we will work down that pathway later. But, first of all, they've chosen to work in a representational manner, that is, that their works form images of either landscape or figure or still life or uh, animals. And we're going to be just investigating, not so much investigating, but we're going to be just examining uh, the rationale for that in a moment. And then I thought we might move the discussion on uh, to a few other matters that may provide a little bit more insight to us all who go and look at their works. Because as in most exhibitions, this is the, the artist sees their work quite a lot in the studio and uh, it comes up in a, a white box, an immaculate white box, I must say, uh, Simon, but um, <laughs> they, it comes up and uh, the, they have a kind of, um, I won't say a change, but a significant shift of identity. But let me, having said that, let's just, to begin with, allow people to explain or to um, look at aspects of uh, their choice of subject matter. I'm going, going to, to, to go to Sophie first and then Marianne for this, and next time we'll go to Marianne first and then Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> the next issue we come to the demon level, yeah. But even. So, <laughs> Sophie, your subject matter, is there something we can... My subject matter yeah. is, well, I think I've called the exhibition of the moment, and um, my subject matter is what inspires me at that time, and often for me it starts with a colour that I start thinking about, and then I start to think about what I can put with that colour, That's especially with my still life. Um, um, yeah, so I've got still life and then I've got landscapes that I do um, sort of plan air from around where I'm living because I love where I live down in South Australia. And also, and now I'm starting to look at flowers a lot more, um, growing them, arranging them. So, yeah. so the, the landscapes do come from direct experience of. Standing there and doing Standing it. there in that moment. Some of them. <laughs> Some of them are photographed. That's, That's right. um, in standing directly doing it. Right. And then there's a few more like uh, that. Mm -hmm. what, what about the still lives? Sophie, are they, are they set up and you work directly from observation or analysis or do you place, do you change the objects after you've set it up or is it, once it's set up, you think that's it, finished? No. Done? No. Yeah, so I know my, that's how my dad used to work. Mm. Things really set up and he didn't really move things around, but I do. Um, I sort of start with that colour, like with these watercolours, I, I got the paper that colour first before I well, I, I place things because you can't um, go over stuff with watercolour, so I just had to get the colour right. Um, yeah. 
And then, yeah, this one I changed a lot. Like, so I had to introduce some um, gouache with watercolour. You don't get to make mistakes. <laughs> but yeah, so, and that orange one, like, that was autumn. And I, I live somewhere where we grow a lot of um, fruit and produce. So I just picked those things and put them together. And the, pers the persimmons on the stick reminded me of um, sort of Chinese ink drawings. And so I wanted to keep the space around it. I didn't want to clutter it up. But yes, yeah, so it sort of bit by bit I might arrange the still life, but not completely. Next question is, is perhaps with the still life, sometimes we can look at a still life and we can notate that there are certain elements that have been included in it, like flowers. And, uh, you know, it brings back that sort of, you know, Western notion of vanitas, of the flowers mm -hmm. representing, the, you know, the, the short period of time we have here on this planet. And uh, it can be seen as very, very strongly evocative of uh, life elements. And do, do you look at the elements you can place in your still life and think, how can this be read? How can this be interpreted? Mm -hmm. Especially the dark one. That one, um, I started thinking about the colour blue, but that was also when COVID was beginning and there was just this sort of fear and um, toxic feeling about people around you. Like, you might, you might have it, and everybody started to behave a bit differently. So I was thinking about, um, yeah, what the things in it that would symbolise um, toxic and decay. And so I went, I went to the um, pine forest and I picked some mushrooms and toadstools and um, moss and I got some old autumn leaves and then I put thistles and so all the sort of things that are, have sort of bad connotations. Um, yeah, it comes from a Dutch um, style of still life called forest paint, forest still life, forest floor still life, where you focus on the decay and the um, things that symbolise that, sort of bad. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just, just finally, the yeah. choice of the horizontal platform, uh -huh. is that a deliberate stabilising element or, or just what seems the most appropriate for In that any, one. any of them? Yeah, that's just what I feel comfortable with. And um, the one next to it, I tried to break that by putting yep. diagonals. Yes. And I, that was really hard for me. Um, and I struggled a lot with that. Um, I don't know if I succeeded. But yeah, because I do, I'm starting to think, well, maybe I shouldn't always use these horizontal. But they're very kind of calming and easier to um, live with. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Sophie. Does anyone have questions for uh, Sophie on the basis of what she's uh, been speaking about? Uh, okay. Yes. Jackie. Jackie, I'm sorry. So, Sophie, you're, when, you choose, when the colour chooses you, yeah. do you have kind of like an emotional or meaning or feeling about that colour, or is it just that you feel attracted mm. to that colour at that moment? Now do you, does it, does it mean, does it have feeling and meaning for you that it, a particular colour? I love orange, um, mm. I probably gravitate to orange. Um, I really struggle with blue, so that was a real challenge for me. Um, and yeah. Why is that so? Why do you struggle with blue? Yeah, I don't know, I just find blue is quite difficult to That's paint, do you? You went through a blue period, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't put it on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. Because blue really attracts a lot of periods. Yeah, yes. Probably a warm, warm palette. Mm. I like blue, but yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the small painting that was on the invitation of the beach, and that st I started that painting on a blue um, canvas that I painted over blue. Uh, it's sort of the one with the aloe plants, yeah. yeah. And the other, the landscape next to it has sort of the yellow skies. And that's sort of, mm, yeah, that, that was 
freezing cold in Mildura. So I got that feeling because it was freezing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so if you, with your still life, um, do you do sketches or studies, or do you just go boom straight onto the paper? Um, I don't do really detailed sketches. Um, with the watercolour, you have to, you don't get too many chances, so I do try and get the composition drawn and stick to it because I don't want to. Um, yeah, I know I can't change things too much. Mm. Oh, thank you, Sophie. That's good, lovely. Thank you, very insightful. Yeah. And, and Marianne, would you like to give insights into your choice, your subject matter, and uh, uh, other factors that might be, okay. be intrinsic parts of your work? Okay. Um, Please. I was sort of thinking about this, and um, I actually went to the dentist the other day, and <laughs> I don't know if this is going. Um, anyway, this fellow has always been, he, he, he and I are quite good friends over the last 20 years, and he's always been interested in my work. And he said to me, um, he wanted to see the pictures of the new work, so I showed him on my phone, and he said to me, um, he said, I've always, he said, you know what I've really noticed over the years? And I said, yeah, what? <laughs> he said, i just do my teeth weed. <laughs> yeah. He said, um, the subject always chooses you. You don't choose the subject. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I thought, that's, that's, that's bloody right, actually. Because I think over the years, I, you know, through, I, my husband and I have travelled a lot and we've lived in other places around the world and in Sydney. And... Um, and so you find your subject matter changes all the time because of your sense of place. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a huge element of my work, is the sense of place. And also having these, and so you're in, you know, different cultures affect you and different, different uh, landscapes and light and all those things. So that's always come into play with my work. Um, so like you say, the, the colour in a way chooses your part and, and for me, mm. The, um, the, the situation which is me. So, for example, I like to tell stories through my work and if there's a happening, I often um, see it and I think about it and I'll, and I'll run with it. So, and I'm finding that still life has a lot of answers for me and you can do a lot with it. And I love bringing a sense of place into my still life, even though I also paint portraiture and some landscape and the figure and things like that. This is my passion, I love still life and I love to see what you can do with it. Mm. And so it varies for me quite a bit. And as I said, when you're living somewhere else and traveling somewhere else, you get all these inspirations from other places and that's happened to my work. So you'll often see my work changes a bit, but it's still the sim there's a similar paint style and things like that, but you'll often see the subject vary. With this particular work, this actually started a few years ago. Um, I was living, we were living in North Asia, and we came back and decided to move down to the Illawarra. And so we were surrounded by, and we were living just sort of under the escarpment. So there was a lot of flora and fauna, and um, my studio was just out the back of my house. It's only small, but it was mine, and I loved it. And there was a lot of, it was just covered in bush and that. And we had these amazing water dragons. There was a little creek running through and there were these beautiful water dragons. We'd come and sit on my little veranda. And so after a while, I, you know, I said, oh, you want to be in these pictures, do you? you know? And so I started this body of work and it started, it was the first body of work was called Still Life of Sorian. The next body of work was um, Rock Paper Lizards. And then it became The Garden and now there's a computer on the lizard. And this is a story that's evolved. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the idea of bringing nature into my still life. Mm -hmm. And I love the, um, uh, so the previous work was just a hint of a tale. Well, and, but it's, this is all a true story that's happened um, in my life. And this particular story now has run into a situation whereby it went past the lizards because a cat was introduced uh, across, uh, a lady moved in across the road and one day I saw a cat come in and start to pick off the lizards 
And it was very hard to watch because they're huge lizards. So my work, this now has evolved into telling that part of the story. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I like cats, I don't mind cats. Um, this particular cat was very hungry because its owner was vegan and it, she decided that the cat was going to be vegan as well. <laughs> so it was starving. So, you know, so that didn't help anybody, did it? But it didn't help the lizards because they couldn't recognise what it was. They thought it was a monster. And they just stop. They don't run off, they just stop. So this thing, they were easy pickings. So I sort of, I started to tell this story with sort of wildlife conservation in mind as well. And I'm just telling a personal story um, with, um, with that in the background, with that, uh, uh, hoping that people become a little more mindful of this stuff, because I think our wildlife is suffering um, and has been suffering over the last few years because of the fires, the floods now. Um, you throw in feral cats and you throw in domestic animals. So, I mean, they're only little things, but they're, we're losing them, you know. The work itself, though, um, there's more to this with the still up, but... Would, would you say there were elements then of, of evocation or symbolism in, in your, your choice of Oh, so very much it so. It does have a narrative. Very much so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah. I won't go into great detail, but the lizards do have a symbolic meaning, and so do cats, and cats have evolved since yeah. sort of Egyptian times, really. But, um, but at the time, it was in my mood at the time as well, and things were going on in my life, and you can see a mood, and I think also you'll find that what's happening to you, mm. as Sophie was saying during COVID, mm. the mood changes, so therefore you often your painting style changes. Yes. Um, the cat represents, um, you know, some certain things that were worrying me at the time, and um, yeah, mm. yes, that's a very good question, thank you. <laughs> but, um, but in saying that, uh, also, I also collect pieces um, from my travels, to Korea in particular, I lived in Korea many years ago. Um, I was really taken by their ceramics. Everything was very ha all handmade. Um, and there's a humanism in their ceramics because they're all made by, well, back then they were made by hand, a lot of it. Um, and I love collecting these beautiful pieces from North Asia and from China <coughs> and from Japan. And also um, finds from nature. So I often go out and if I see something, I'll, I'll just, if I, I'll just find it. Like, you, you know, you get inspired by collecting, having your own collection of things that you can put into your paintings. And it becomes like a really lovely dialogue in your, in your paintings when you have those similar pieces that keep popping up. Mm. Oh, thank you. That's right. That's really, really insightful. <laughs> uh, is there anyone with, who would like to raise a question or just, just to respond in any way to what Marianne's been saying? Yes. You know I love your colour, the way you use colour. I mean, my face, I talk to you about it before, how much I love that. But this, this sense of clutter, this, your composition is just so very strong, but, but then it's this clutter, and does that feed back into that idea of the narrative, that it's, it's somehow you make it work so that it doesn't overwhelm and the composition works beautifully, but there's so much happening. Yeah, it's funny. That's, thanks, Jenny. That's a good question because a lot of my work used to be, I used to like negative space or prefer negative space around the object, but I sort of wanted to push it myself further and see if I could create more into a composition. Um, I actually, I really appreciate it. Sophie came up with a, a, something the other day and she said, you look at Brock. And I thought, oh my God, yeah. Like, there's clutter, but you can identify everything. And I, I think I just wanted to sort of push myself further and I, I found myself, putting a lot of my compositions in the middle of a canvas, and now I'm not. I'm sort of using the whole canvas, and and also, now you've just hit on the head, where I was living down at, on, under the escarpment, as I said, there was a lot of bush, and it was really um, chaotic, <laughs> green chaotic. So wherever you are, tends to flow into the composition. That's what I was saying, a sense of place can often affect what you're painting. So there was a lack of clarity, but now um, I'm living out at Camden now, and that that all that chaos has moved away, and I have more light coming in, so that I can see my paintings are going to change again. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. Marianne, just moving on to the, the 
next area of broad-based focus that I was thinking about. And I was going to just ask both people to study with Marianne um, about a, a, a rationale or the, or the basis for their, their selection of certain formal elements that are part of their work. Like, first of all, we have the selection of scale. Uh, I, I suspect that, particularly when you're painting intimate objects, still life, there is some advantage in the spectator being able to have to come to the work to experience it from, say, that distance away, rather than walk into a room and there's a three metre by three metre picture of an owl or something, you know, which I'm sure is out there. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of this because, um, like most people who, who see quite a few artworks, you do become aware of the physical presence and the fact that that, in, that carries with it some sort of implicitness that you actually move and make a connection, if it's a small painting, from that far away. Uh, I have a friend, digressing, I have a friend who works in very, very large scale with geometric abstraction. And every now and then we talk about things and he some always reminds me that the most impactful painting he thinks that he's seen for decades is Vermeer's painting of the girl in the red hat, which is that big, mm -hmm. A4. <clears throat> and he says that had the greatest impact on him. Now, I can see that there might there seems to be a deliberate choice to constrict or don't constrict is too strong yeah, a word yeah. to work within limitations so that the spectator sees the entirety of the work. Could you is, could you expand on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, like to, I'll try. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. thinking, thinking. Um, well, I like to paint on different sizes. I think it's good for you to um, because I think sometimes. I don't know, sometimes it's sort of just nice to do something very intimate mm. and so you're so one on one with it. To me, the, the, the painting, the doing the painting is everything. That's the important bit and I find that intimacy really fabulous and I love being one on one and I like working on my own by the way, I don't like working with other people so <laughs> I have to, it has to be that one on one except if Elizabeth's right. there but, yes. um, <laughs> but I really think that some things work better small and others larger and it's one of the reasons I rather like to expand with the different um, sections often it grows one. I did mm -hmm. I did and then I thought if it grows it grows so which one is the mm. first um, uh, the one at this end, I think. Mm -hmm. I had to say the one on the left. Yeah, the one, the mask was actually found in the garden. It was a plat It was made from plaster, and it was buried in this very vast sort of weed garden. And I pulled it out, and I thought, wow, that reminds me of, you know, that's that's like the the it's like a, a monster that the that the lizards are seeing. They're not seeing cat or human or dog, or they're not identifying anything. They're just seeing something that doesn't work for them and they can't identify it. Um, but going back to your question, Ed, um, I really like working, and I really love working with panels. I've done a lot of panel paintings, huge panel paintings, and I love working with them bit by bit and bringing it together and moving them around. I find that extremely interesting. That's one of the things I do. Um, so when I do a huge painting, it's always mm. through panels. Mm. Yeah. So does that sort of answer mm. your question? I think it does, yeah. But it's yeah. more about intimacy. And sure. Sometimes I don't want to paint big. Sometimes I just want to go small. Mm. You know, I just love that feeling. Yeah, but other small. times I want to it's push crazy. it further. Yeah. 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 Sophie, would you like to give us possibly some insights into your choice scale. of scale? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> well, look, it's noticeable. If you're yeah. coming in as an outsider, one can yeah. just simply make the simple and bland observation that the still lives seem to be bigger than the landscapes. What's, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we know how big the world is? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's because I like to do the landscapes out there, so I can't really carry it big. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. And then, I don't know, this is not relevant, but... I do sort of read, we do read paintings from yes. the left to the right, yes. I think. So it's like reading a book. So you sort of want the eye to go, yeah. well, I know people's eyes do do that. So you want your painting to sort of read from left to right. Um, 
I, I find with the uh, landscapes mm. that their, their, their relative smallness mm -hmm. gives them an intensity yeah. that, uh, 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 that I find quite evocative. Yeah. yeah, I like, I'm going a bit smaller at the moment, mm. sort of going back to small, but I, last show I had a huge painting which was um, really challenging for me, and I'd like to do more of that, to be honest, but it's really quite logistically <laughs> hard to do really big painting. <laughs> Sure, we would all understand. Yeah. I should mention too that yeah. often a painting size yeah. is um, it, it, it happens because you are only have a small space to work in. Yeah. That's so I think yeah. that actually says a lot because, yeah. like, I mean, at times I've just worked in the kitchen. So yeah. you know, I haven't always had a studio. Um, yeah. I don't have one at the moment, which I'm hoping to rectify. But yeah. often you just have a small space. So that that determines yeah. what you're going to paint, what size, yeah. and if you can get it outside or in, or, you know, yeah. so often that would yeah. be, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I was, like, see how you've got a lot of things going on in your painting, yeah. some, in these ones I was trying to sort of remove, get rid of, um, yeah, the needed space, yeah, I was important. trying to make mm. some space in my paintings, mm. which I don't always do, so, yeah, it's yeah. challenging, mm. it is, does anybody have any, any, any queries or any questions they would like, uh, to ask Sophie about the connection with scale or size or what have, whatever word we want to use. Okay. Well, I, one thing I'm noticing, Sophie, is that the, <laughs> the gouaches, they're a lot airier. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Uh, it's watercolour, so I was trying mm. to use the watercolour because it's a very um, light, air, um, luminous. Mm. Mm medium, so I was trying to maximise that. Mm. I bought canvas that you're supposed to do watercolour on. I like it. I tried it. But what would you do with it then? You'd have to put it under glass, I guess. No. Watercolour on yeah. canvas. <laughs> it worked quite well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, just moving along down a, a, a similar track, um, we've talked about the sense of scale or the, 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 the relationship to size and choices and whatever that may be governed by all sorts of factors, that's what, uh, as we've noted. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing that I was going to lead, lead to is we're looking at other formal components of the paintings that exclude subject matter, but we do make the observation that there is a painterliness about most of the works. Now, what does this word painterly, painterliness mean? And have we deliberately de deployed it so that uh, the work gives us the, 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 in, the evidence of work being constructed by the pushing around of this pigmented emulsion that we call paint mm. and leaving evidence of the mark making, the gestion, mm. all of those sorts of things. How, how much is that part of what the way you well, choose I, to work? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I've used three different mediums here. I've used oils. Um, acrylics and watercolours and they all tell you how to work quite differently so it's it does um yeah the medium really dictates how you paint um i'm finding acrylic more enjoyable i never used to like it um but it's quite um forgiving and it's you can just take it out with you and it dries and it's um and you can cover things up easily and it Whereas an oil painting, if you do a lot of layers, it can start to look a bit tired or mm. heavy. So definitely um, each painting I'm trying to sort of um, honour the medium that I'm using. Mm. Yeah. And do you, um, you were saying earlier that you work often from direct experience, but sometimes also from photographs. Yeah. Do you find that what you from photograph changes the interpretation that you place on the or, or, or on the paint surface itself? Is that does that change because you're you're working from already a, a recording, a photographic recording of a colour area or something? Yeah, um, actually, I you know I never used to work from photograph. I used to want to paint from photographs, and I sort of thought it was a bad thing because of my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then I sort of have started using some, and my friend Stuart McFarlane came to my exhibition, and we've got quite a good 
rapport with, with our paintings. And he said, oh, why don't we use a photograph of that? <laughs> 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 oh, well, that was good. Uh, so, what did you say that Mr. He said that he likes the ones that where I do the photographs. <laughs> shall we, shall we <laughs> keep, keep those secret? We won't tell you. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. Right. But also, I do use um, Google a lot because I, I think, oh, I want to put such and such in my painting and I can't, I don't know where it is. I'm going to get that. So I just Google a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I make the point that yeah. artists have off, ever since the first. Uh, um, uh, projected images were developed. Artists have, have deployed whatever mm -hmm. whatever mechanical mm -hmm. image they, they needed in order to inform the painting that they were going to make. And the, mm -hmm. you know, the first even the, the first statement of the death of painting we can find is 1621. So painting has existed quite happily mm -hmm. alongside other mediums as they've, they've developed. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the first daguerreotypes, what 1837, 1838, or something, were also meant to signify the death of painting mm -hmm. as well. Plus I shan't. Yeah. So if we can move it, if Marianne, how do you do? Do you make more choices? Yeah. Uh, in, in this manner for your I do, work. I do. Yeah. Um, I usually I prefer to paint from real life. Um, I like the fact that you can see around the object. I like the fact that it will change from, the, for example, in regard to still life. I like setting up. A, uh, composition. I get a lot of joy out of that. I get a lot of joy out of the placement and setting it up in front of me. And I really love the fact that a different time of the day will dictate how that painting will go. I love the fact that, particularly in the afternoons, so I love afternoon light. I find that more exciting. And I love the fact that I do this with my students too. I love the way that you can set up a still life in the morning. And then in the afternoon, you're challenged because the light has changed and you get shadows and things like that. So I like those little gifts that come from real life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think I, I just get a lot of pleasure out of things and, and the object themselves. And I love the fact that you can touch an object. Um, it, it can be tactile. I love, as I said, I love seeing the light bounce off it. I love to see the changing light, the sky, all those things. Mm. Um, but again, you know, you use tools as well. And sometimes I, I do a lot of drawing. I paint directly onto my surface with paint. I draw in paint. Mm. So I don't use pencil mm. um, because I like to see where it goes. I like that little bit more fluid and mm -hmm. I don't mind. We talk about mistakes and I find mistakes are often again a gift. Um, so things will come out, so you can't really expect too much of what's going to come. Mm. You have to go with the flow a little bit. I really like that excitement of it. Mm. And so with your like owl that you've got in there, yeah. did, how did you find him? Yeah, well that's that's a good point. Um, he was in a tree trunk mm -hmm. that was sort of just up here. Mm -hmm. right. So um, I took a photograph of him mm -hmm. because it was hard to get him. Yeah. But also, he's so easy to draw as well. Yeah. So, but like you, it's it's like you know you can use photographs, you know. Yeah. But I get more joy out of real life. But sometimes you play around, you know, to get what you need. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I just but I I love the fact that I like painting straight on the surface. Yeah. I like to draw. Right. Yeah. I, and, and you know, at the end of the day, if the drawing doesn't pan out, you turn it around and do a different paint. Like, mm. I mean, you, you can play with these things and then you'll get something else that's come out you weren't expecting. So, yeah. I used to share a studio with um, Anna Flatten oh, yeah. in Adelaide for about 10 years. Mm. And she would do these really detailed drawings first, yes. get the tone exactly right, and yeah. it really pretty much didn't change from that. And yeah. it could take a year to get. I think that's the yeah, other thing too, because you can, yeah. but you can do the drawing yeah. first, yeah. learn yeah. from it, and then apply the paint. You know, so you can practice in advance. Yeah. You know, and I find that very helpful. Yeah. You know, that's how you feel on the day, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I always find though with that, like the Anna we talked about with Anna Plata, you can have a drawing and you have a total study yeah. and you have it all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And then get a bit of colour on your brush and uh -huh. the whole thing changes completely. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't think you can predetermine paintings. 
Um, yeah. And you know, I don't think you can do that because it'll never, you'll just let yourself down because it'll never come out the way you're planning. Don't plan. I, um, let it happen. I yeah. use acrylic for the beginning stages. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't have it all worked out and I get to the, I get it to the stage with my acrylic where it's worked out and then yeah. I can put my old paint on. Right. That's oh, interesting. Yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Anybody have any queries from um, Marianne about uh, her working processes? I'm sure there's some secrets that she would like to maintain. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. I won't miss them all. No, look. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. just feel free to ask anything if you want. So I was thinking about with the Korean yeah. Ceramics. Yeah. The salad you didn't get seduced by the salad Oh, I colour. sure did. Yeah. I sure did. I, right. I did a number of um, bodies of work based on that. Uh, the salad <coughs> is the most beautiful green, and mm. and the shapes oh, are magnificent. It's really hard to paint that colour. It's, it's really a very hard colour. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, but I did a lot of work with that, and yeah, I had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, this was going back to over 20 years ago, yeah, right, um, okay. so I ended up having two or three shows in Korea. Um, and it was lovely at the time because there was a lot of French people living in Korea at the time. So I was, I was sort of getting into that world a little bit, uh, which was nice. Um, but the Celadon is beautiful. Like yes. it's the most beautiful. And it, that was the time of just painting the objects very, you know, very simply because they're too beautiful to muck around with. Mm -hmm. You want to keep it simple, mm -hmm. it's all there. It's all there, mm -hmm. that's right. And I love the fact that, with, for example, as I said before, they were creating back then, they were creating celadon and, and, and uh, ceramics by hand. And, and if you saw a thumbprint or something in it, that was the joy because it was the humanism that came into the object. And so you were trying to capture that. And I do a lot of that work, actually. This, is, this body of work is a little bit different to what I normally do as well, mm -hmm. in a way, because of nature's come into it. But a lot of my work is about the object mm. and about seeing the flaws and, and finding beauty in flaws and in fragility. So... Well, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay. well, thanks, Marianne. Um, just to move along just a little bit, um, we have been talking about the way in which both artists uh, see their work fitting into the... Just to move into this, the next maybe phase of discussion. Um, if I can give an analogy, or not an analogy, a, a, an anecdote. Some years ago, I, um, decades ago, um, I read an interview with Gerhard Richter and uh, they asked him why he was doing these low horizon landscapes, as he was at the time. And uh, that would have been that week for Richter. But um, they were asking him why he was doing these low horizon landscapes. And one of the people who was questioning him, and this is in about 1990, he said, uh, Mr. Richter, don't you realise that that kind of landscape with the, like the, 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 the monk by the sea, uh, don't you know that those kind of landscapes were dead, finished, kaput? Mm -hmm. And Richter looked back and he said, every time I go to the, the Romantics Gallery in Berlin, I look and I see Caspar David Friedrich's monk by the sea and I see it in that moment, in 1990, mm -hmm. not in 1809. So the point that I'm getting to is that most of us who work with paint or who paint find ourselves not so much influenced but very interested in artists from the current uh, practice or from the past practice. Which ones or where would you, can you think of artists whose work doesn't have to influence you but it might just interest you? Can you think of artists work? Oh. <laughs> a lot. You don't have to. <laughs> I have a really, really huge library yes. um, from my dad, which I look at a lot. So yeah. um, when I've sort of got my colour in my head, and then I'm trying to think, well, how am I going to make this into a painting? Sometimes I just get my still life history of still life book, and I start. Yeah going through it and seeing one will sort of sort of look, oh yeah, I can use that Dutch style for that painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's like most of us, we don't, we don't work in a vacuum, do we? We, we work in, you know, the world around us is there. Yeah. No, and then yeah. last year they had this Clarice Beckett exhibition oh, in yes. South Australia, which yes. was a real hit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I suppose I was looking at her landscapes, but I can't be very 
fuzzy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mine sort of always end up quite under your fuzzy. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, sorry, I'll say something. Um, I, can't, I can't paint with these round Clarice Becker uses these sort of brushes that you can't get a, a straight line with them. Same. I'm like, no. no. So I like my really crisp brushes. Yeah. You can't really change it. I try. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Okay. Um, oh, how long is it? piece of string, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many artists. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think, I'll put them in categories. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Australian past artists. I'm really liking Grace Crowley's work at the moment. I'm looking a lot at, at her work. Um, and I love the way she started to do some very Cubist type work. Um, I was living in Spain for a couple of years, up until 2000, end of 2019. I was looking at the Cubists while I was there, and that had a big influence. Mm. Um, so the Cubists, the purists. Oh, yes, um, yes. But going back to Grace Crowley, I love that she was exploring that. And I really love a lot of the artists you mentioned, so the artists between the wars, the women mm. artists between the wars. I'm finding them very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I also like, um, I'm just trying to think, um, the today's artists. Um, there's two in particular that stand out for me, Australian artists. And that's Kevin Lincoln from Melbourne. Uh, he originally from Tasmania, but from Melbourne. I really like um, Peter Godwin. I find him extraordinary. He's with Defiance Gallery. Um, Peter, uh, I was lucky to have Peter as a teacher at one stage for drawing. Uh, and he's just got this amazing confidence with the brush and still life. But I love the fact that with Kevin Lincoln, you go back to that negative space you're talking about, the same thing. Um, I love that about his work. And he has Japanese influences as well. Um, going back to, say, international artists, I particularly, I've mentioned Barak, great fan of Mirandi, if you can't tell. Um, also, um, Bonnard. Mm. And um, I very much like an artist called Ivan Hitchens, have you heard of him? A fabulous landscape artist. I love his placement. Um, let me see, who else? Oh, Gauguin. Really love him. Love his, love his colours. Um, beautiful, inspirational, jewel-like colours. Um, so, yeah, I just, and as I said, but more now, I'm starting to sort of, sort of hit on these sort of cube, not intense cubist, but I'm loving the, um, the things you can do with the backgrounds, you know, and I'm taking a little bit of cubism into my backgrounds, which I'm finding very exciting, breaking up those um, backgrounds and, and um, giving it different push and pull effects and things and and I'm a tonal artist as well so not just greys and browns as you can see here I love tone but if you go into different colours and I, I tell you I particularly like um, Max Meldrum oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, from Melbourne and he was part of the tonalist movement with Clarice Beckett of course who came into it part from the time but I'm a great fan of Max Meldrum's work and I think he was very underrated. It, we all, um, when you hear about Max Meldrum, it's all about mm. all the tantrums he was pulling, but at the end of the day, his painting is exquisite. Um, so as a tonalist, um, I always sort of work toward, go towards the tonalist. So, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, good, thanks. Right. <laughs> <coughs> Does anybody have any questions they would like to, uh, uh, or any factors they would like to discuss a little bit further? <laughs> well, I think this just about brings us to closure, um, and I, I, I thank both Marianne thank you, and Thank you. <laughs> it was a pleasure. It's, it's, it's been just great to hear you speak about your own work, and I'm sure it's provided all of us here with much greater insights than we, yeah. you know, yeah. than we, we, we came into the exhibition with. I think we feel very dull, so we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.
continue the conversation privately with them and then yeah. enjoy the exhibition. Yeah.